Life can be stressful for a variety of reasons. And uh, experts tell us that there are 10, the top 10 most stressful jobs. Do you want to know what they are? Top 10. So we'll start with 10, work our way back. Think if you can think of what's number one. Number 10, being a secretary. That's number 10. So it's, there's stress there, but not, not that much. Number nine, a waitress. Any waitresses here? No tax on tips coming up here pretty soon. <laughs> Number eight, being a, a clerk at a customer complaint department <laughs> where you hear nothing but complaints all day long. That's number six. Number seven, journalists battling deadlines. Always the next thing to go. Number five, a medical intern. Long hours, emergency situations, and you don't feel like you've got the skills to handle all that you need to, to do. Number four, air traffic controllers. Thousands of lives at, at your hand. Number three, uh, miners working underground, just listening for that sound, for something to cave in. Number two, police officers. Thank God we've got a lot of police officers in our congregation, and thank God that God protects them. And number one, an inner city high school teacher. If you've ever been, ever been in a high school, and especially in the inner city, they go through metal detectors, they got weapons, they're defiant. They're just... Now, the least stressful. <laughs> Guess what's the least stressful job in the world? Thank you. Being a minister. Now, I just want to tell you, it is. I love, my, I love what I do. I mean, I don't feel like I have a job. I just, I love what I do. But this was the reasoning they gave for two reasons. Number one, they're sure there's a heaven, and I am. And number two, they're sure they're going there, and I am both. I am both. I'm sure there's a heaven, and I know I'm going there. But I want everybody to know the same stuff. The number two least stressed job is an attorney. I know. But their reasoning was, they're sure they're not going to jail. <laughs> You've heard that old joke, don't you? That they, they have, uh, they've captured, um, uh, the, the attorneys were having a convention in Chicago, and some terrorists come in and they captured the whole convention uh, center, and they said that uh, if, if the U.S. complies, uh, they will let them out one at a time. That's not the joke. <laughs> I can't remember exactly how it goes. <laughs> they capture the attorneys. I'll tell it to you next week. <laughs> that just came to me, and it's a bad idea. But stress, stress, people live with stress. And, and two things about stress. Number one, it's not healthy. Now, they tell us that there are 5 million people that are having heart conditions in America. Every year, 5 million people. They say half are physical and half are emotional. That is that they're stress-related. Heart problems because of being stress-related. And so uh, we need to get rid of this. The, the, the high blood pressure and the, the heart attacks, that is stress-related. And it's, it's not healthy for you to, to be stressed out. When, when I... I came down here many years ago, and <clears throat> just when I, after I came down, <clears throat> the Portland Trailblazers had the number one pick in the draft. Now, they had not been successful before. You know, they passed up uh, Michael Jordan for the well-known center, LaRue Martin. I'm sure you've heard of LaRue Martin. No. Another time, they, <laughs> they drafted... Stu Immons' daughter came to our church, so I knew all these things, and she would tell me different things, but they, they drafted a guy named Wally, and Wally's now on, on uh, the NBA when they do championships and stuff, but the, the word around Portland was Wally who? So they passed on Michael Jordan to do LaRue Martin. But this year, in 1986, I was so excited because they got the number one draft again in the pick, uh, pick in the draft, 
and they chose the leading center on the leading team in America. That's Kentucky, and his, his name was Sam Bowie. Ever remember Sam Bowie? He was, he was like seven feet tall, and, and uh, so they drafted him, but they've had, they, had, they were unsuccessful draft after draft, and this was no, this was no different because uh, one night in October, he had just been drafted. He just starting his first season there. Uh, they heard a loud crunch, and his leg broke. His leg, he just twisted, went up for a rebound, came down, <laughs> broke. And they said that it started as a stress fracture. He didn't know it was there, but it started as a stress fracture. But because he didn't give his leg rest, he, he was feeling aches, but he thought, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a first round draft cho choice and I'm getting a lot of money. I need to play. So he played until stress came down him, boom, and he had a compound fracture and never played again. Sam Bowie never played again. Then, of course, they got... Uh, Bill Walton after that, which that worked out very, very well. But uh, all that to say, if you go with not, not detecting the stress in your life, it's not healthy for you. It's not healthy for your heart. It's not healthy for any part of you. If you're here today and you're stressed about anything, before you leave here, I want that to be relieved from you and I want you to leave here in peace. It's not healthy for you and, and you're not happy. People who are stressed are unhappy people. It just kind of goes together. You know, you're just worried about stuff all the time. And so you're, you're thinking, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And so it, it leads to this unhappiness that, that, that we have. And so if you're happy today, you don't have stress. If you've got stress, you're not happy. And maybe you're not happy because you have stress. So how do we get rid of this stuff? And I want to give you four, uh, four suggestions out of the passage that Jimmy just stole from me, Philippians chapter 4, Philippians chapter 4, four things I want to say today. Number one is rejoice always. Now, verse 4 says this, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, rejoice. Say that out loud me. Rejoice in the Lord Rejoice means to be happy. Are you happy? Yes. It says, now this is, this is the problem with this verse. Rejoice in the Lord. Always is the problem. I mean, we can rejoice, but when do you rejoice? Always. How can you do that? Well, it tells us in, in, this, in, the, in the whole book, it says nine times in this, in this book, it says this phrase, in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. Always. The only way you can rejoice is in the Lord. The only way you can live is in the Lord. Nine times, in the Lord, in the Lord, in the Lord, in the Lord. But rejoice is, it's first it's a decision that you make, but then it's in the Lord. He helps us to be happy campers. He helps us to rejoice. And when stress comes on, we, we refuse to give in to that no matter where it comes from. One guy was so stressed out, his mother-in-law came to live with him. And so that was creating some headbutting with his wife. And so he decided, I'm getting out of this stress. And so he went for a walk. And on the walk, he's just thinking, oh, I got to get rid of the stress, got to get rid of the stress. And he sees a, a, a hearse with a big dog in it and another hearse at a stop sign. And he's right there at the stop sign. So he goes up and he, and he, and he says, What's, there's 50 people here. There's this hearse and this hearse. What's going on here? He said, well, in this hearse is my wife. In the next hearse is my mother-in-law. You see this dog here? Yes. This dog killed them both. He said, can I borrow your dog? He said, get in line. So we, I remember that punchline. Rejoicing is being happy. The Lord wants you to be happy and to be joyful, and it's a choice that you make. If you're, if you're unhappy, you're choosing to be unhappy. How many want to be happy? I choose joy. I choose joy today. Say that out loud. I choose joy. So we rejoice in the Lord always. That's the key. We rejoice in the Lord always. And the second thing is that we pray 
in everything. Next verse. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Verse 5. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Now, back up just a little bit. Back up. To five. Let your, the word gentleness is graciousness or kindness. Don't stress out. Be kind. Be gracious. Because the Lord's right here. He sees what you're, what you're doing. He sees what you're going through. He wants to help you, but he is right here. So first of all, rejoice in the Lord. Let your gentleness be known to all people, even people that, that drive wildly. <laughs> rejoice, be gracious. And then the second thing is verse six, and be anxious for what? Nothing. Anxious for nothing but prayer in, but in everything with prayer and supplication. So there's two different kinds of prayer there. Be anxious for nothing, but pray in everything. Amen. So the second thing that we do, we, number one, we rejoice. And number two, we pray. About what? Everything. Well, I don't want to bother the Lord. You're not a bother. But it's just a little thing. There are no little things. He cares. Listen, your thumbprint is unique. Your eye print is unique. Your voice print is unique. He cares about everything about you. You are uniquely you, and even your problems are uniquely you. So you tell him what, what concerns you. The Bible says it. He, he numbers the very hairs on your head. So you comb today and you lost two. He knows. He knew before you combed. He knows after you comb. He cares about everything in your life. So he says, unburden yourself on me. My yoke is easy and my burden is like, like. So he doesn't want us to be cumbered down, encumbered with anything, but we weighed down with anything, but, but pray about everything. Now, you know, they did a study. I read this several years ago. An insurance company did a study and they, they, they discovered this life insurance company. People that go to church once a week live on average 5.7 years longer than people who don't go to church. Going to church is good for you. Did you know that? Part of the reason why is when you come, and it was once a week, you come once a week, you come here and you, you let it out. You give the Lord your problems. You praise the Lord. And you lift him up and not your problems. And your focus gets off of you and off of your problems and onto him. And you realize that if we magnify the Lord, then what I'm going through is, is so petty. It's so small. And you end up living longer. You want to live longer? If you're watching there today, you want to live longer? Come to church. Or keep watching on church. I know we have people all over the world watching. Watch. But be faithful about it. And you got problems? Give them to Jesus. He says, go back again to that uh, the scripture. But by prayer and supplication. Now, what is supplication? Supplication is ongoing, aggressive prayer because you're in a battle. Prayer is like petition. Lord, I, I want you to do this. You, you have not because you don't ask. So prayer is asking God for something. That's petition. Supplication is an ongoing battle because you're trying to release something that the Lord wants to give, but it's not free until you release it. Amen. And the key to releasing some things for people and even you is asking prayer, staying at it, staying at it, staying at it. L last Sunday, somebody told me about uh, Mike, who's in the hospital. So I went to see him this week, one day. Jimmy went the next day. And uh, the doctors said, well, there's nothing we can do because your stomach and your colon are attached. He couldn't eat. He was losing weight like crazy. He said, nothing we can do except maybe go to surgery, but we don't know you can live through surgery. So I went down and prayed for him one day. Jimmy went down, prayed for him the next day. And then uh, I felt like I should text him. And so I said, because he, here's what he decided. He was going to go home, give up and just, wait for Jesus to come get him. So I text him and I said, I, I know this is your decision, but I feel strongly that you should go back and, and you should, the Lord can heal or the doctors can heal. God's not opposed to doctors, but you're, it's, now is not your time. So we went back to the doctor. Jimmy just told me this this morning or yesterday. He went back to, he went back to the hospital after going home, 
making a decision to go on hospice and dying, he decided to go back to the, back to the hospital. They did two MRIs and they said, it's gone. The blockage is gone. We don't even need surgery. You're going to be fine. And, it, and his son uh, texted today and said, he's smiling. He's laughing. He's sitting up. He's like his old self. What happened? Prayer changes everything. But that's, that is supplication. There's prayer where you ask and nothing happens. What do you do? You go again and you go again and you go again like, like uh, Elijah. Seven times. You go again. You go again until you see something manifest and, and you know that's the Lord. The Lord hears us. He wants to answer prayer. Don't let the enemy discourage you and defeat you. Say, well, nothing's going to happen anyway. You, if you, oh, I've been prayed for before. Get prayed for again yeah. and again. Yeah. Break through on this. That's what supplication means. Rejoice always and pray about everything. Rejoice with prayer and supplication. Let your request be made known to God uh, with thanksgiving. That's the other third. That's the third thing with thanksgiving. This is one of the healthiest Attitude things you can have is thanksgiving. Are you a thankful person? <coughs> not, not very many thankful here. Are you thankful? If you're feeling, dis if you're here today and you say, it's, it's you know, one thirty outside, how can I, whatever, you can't let the outside regulate your life. You know, we've got thermostats now that are regu regulating in here. And, and uh, so, we're stepping. Are you cool? Yeah. We worked on the air conditioners. We worked on the thermostats and we're getting it cool in here. Thank God. Uh, but you regulate your life by thanksgiving. Let your supplication, let your, your prayers pray and everything with supplication and thanksgiving. If you are discouraged today about anything, I challenge you. Jot down 10 things you're thankful for. See, what happens to us is we focus on what is wrong with our life, not what is right with our life. If you focus on what is wrong in your life, you're going to find a lot of things wrong. If you focus on what is right in your life, you're going to find a lot of things right. If you're a visitor here, somebody brought you here, if you're just watching for the first time and you're saying, you know, I don't know about this place. If you're looking for something wrong, you're going to find it. If you're looking for something right, you're going to find it. What I'm saying to you is, Look for something right. You'll find it. I'm not a bad guy. This is a good place. You got good people around you. This, you know, well, you may not be good, but they're good. The people right next to you, they're good. There's something right about them. Get fresh perspective as you give thanks to the Lord for what he has done. He wants us to be thankful people. The problem is, just like Jesus with the ten lepers, only one comes back. We are, by and large... Uh, not mindful of the things that we should be. And so we are not thankful. So we need to, we need to be giving thanks to the Lord in all things. And, and uh, reminds me of a, of a story of a guy who went to his uh, 25th high school reunion. And uh, he was there sitting at his table with his wife. And right next door was a, a, another, another group of people and one lady who was obnoxious and loud and she was pounding down the drinks. And she was kind of falling down drunk. And his wife looked over to him and said, you went to this school. Do you know that gal? He said, yes. He said, in fact, I dated her in high school. And when we split up, I understand, she took the drink. The wife said, wow. Who could think someone could celebrate that long? <laughs> See, it's perspective. It's just perspective. <laughs> so, in everything, give thanks. Are you thankful? Yes. Turn to somebody, tell somebody what you're thankful for. <laughs> Number four. Back to the verses again. Let's go back to the verses. Philippians 4. Let's go back further. What are we going to review? Verse 4. Verse 4. Verse 4. There we go. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I'm going to say to you, rejoice. If you're stressed out, rejoice, number one. Number two, let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. 
Verse 6, be anxious for nada. Nothing. But in everything. By prayer and supplication. So there's two different kinds of things there. There's petition where you ask. Then there's this aggressive prayer when you continue to knock down until something happens. You push until something happens. That's, that's what prayer is. Verse 7. There we go. And the peace of God, which surpasses understanding. You can't explain it. But when you pray about something, it's what God does. He gives you a peace that you can't explain, but it guards your heart and your mind. Now, when you're stressed out, two things get affected. Your mind goes, you know, I wonder what could happen. And back to the fear thing. You're thinking the worst. You're thinking what's wrong, what could go wrong. And so he guards, when you pray, he guards your mind. And he guards your heart from, from being doubtful or suspicious or skeptical. So the peace of God rules in your heart and mind. And then the last two verses is, is the fourth thing. And that is think rightly. Verse, verses uh, 8 and 9. Jump, jump there, would you? Finally, or in conclusion, brethren, and he gives, he gives eight filters to filter your thoughts through. Whatever things are true. Somebody tells you something, is it true? Okay. Second, is it noble? Or is it something that brings you up or is it something that's beneath you? You don't listen to some conversations. They're beneath who you are. They're, they're ignoble. You're noble. Are they, are they true? Are they noble? Are they just? Whatsoever things are pure, is it pure? Whatsoever things are lovely, Whatever things are of a good report, if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, think on these things. So when you, when you start, and every day you think all the time. You don't, while you're in here, you're thinking. I just wish he'd be done. You're thinking all the time. I can't wait to go home and watch the British Open. I can't wait for lunch. What are we having for lunch? We, we think all the time. What the Bible says is, to put a filter on your thinking. Is this, is this something that is true? Is this something that is, that is right? It is, is, it, is it noble or ignoble? Is it something that's virtuous? It's pure. It, it, you put that filter on there because as the Bible says, as a man thinks, so he is. What goes through your mind controls your actions. And so you've got to guard what comes in your mind. That's why Jesus said, Take heed what you see. Take heed what you hear. You've got to be careful of the, the eye gate, the ear gate, what comes into your life because it'll come out and it'll produce things in your life. Those are seeds that get sown that, that'll, that'll reap a, a cultivation that you may or may not want. So if you cultivate only the good things, if they're, if they're good, if it's a good report, if it's praiseworthy, if it's pure, think on those things. Let that be on your heart and on your mind. If you, well, you say, what if I have a problem? Then you, you, you give it to the Lord and say, Lord, you work on this situation. The Lord has a solution for every problem. You know that. Amen. And the Lord gives us ideas to, to, to deal with every problem. I'm, I'm going back to do my niece's um, wedding. And uh, my, my niece graduated from Hoover High School, which reminded me of this of this uh, illustration. A guy named Murray Spangler was a janitor in a department store in Canton, Ohio. And uh, so he would sweep every night. And, and his, it, it was hard on him because his lungs were, were not that strong. And so he would cough, he'd wheeze, he'd cough, he'd wheeze. And they had this idea. What if instead of, instead of sweeping the, all the dust and getting all the things in the air, what if we could just Suck it up. Instead of brushing it up, what if we could suck it up? And so he invented, it was, it was coarse at first, but he invented the first vacuum sweeper. And then he went to his friend who was in business. He owned a leather company and, and said, could you help me? I don't know anything about business, but I've got this idea. Could you help me? Could you finance a thing? The guy said, yeah, I can. The guy's name? Hoover. Hoover. 
was a guy. That's where my, my niece graduated from high school, Hoover High in North Canton, Ohio. Uh, because the Lord has something in mind that you have no idea what may be a problem right now. God's going to create a magnificent solution for you that is larger than you can think of and do greater things than you can imagine. But just think right. Lord, you've given me this. You've got a solution for this. I'm not going to stress out over this. Holy Spirit, I choose joy. I give this to you. I, give, I thank you for what you're doing. You're doing something. Even though I'm sweeping, you're doing something. And what he's doing, he's trying to get things out of your life. Suck it out of your life. Hoover it out of your life. So you, you, you leave here with a clean mind. Guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. So are you stressed? Good. If, were you stressed when you came in? Good. Some of you were. Now, let me tell you why I'm not, because I'm a minister. I know two things. I know there's a heaven, and I know I'm going there. Do you know that? If you're watching, do you know that? Everybody can have the peace of a minister. There is a heaven. It's true. Jesus is there, and I'm going to join him someday. I'm not in a hurry, but I'm going to join him someday, and I'm sure of that. If you want to be sure... If you want to have peace forever, you know, one of the greatest fears people have is fear of death. And we don't talk about it, but people are afraid of dying. You don't need to be afraid anymore. You can have peace. How? I know where I'm going. And I know it's real. I know heaven is real and I'm going there. If you don't know that, I want to pray for you. So just close your eyes there. Father, we thank you that you've sent Jesus that showed us how to live as a man, but even how to die. When you rose, when he rose from the dead and he led captivity captive, he, he from, the, from the guy, thief on the cross, today you'll be with me in paradise. It's not how righteous we've been, it's how righteous you make us. And so we walk in faith, we receive you by faith, we believe you by faith, and thank you, Lord, that heaven is not a place for perfect people. It's for people who are being perfected by your spirit and people who are righteous because you bring that to us. It's not what we bring to you. It's what you bring to us. So we receive your righteousness today by faith. We receive the promise of heaven today. We have assurance that heaven's real. We'll be there someday because we trust you for that. Now let the peace of God that we can't explain. If we have other problems, Problems with, with our business, problems with our family, problems with our neighbors, problems with relatives, problems with our health. Lord, we give those to you. We thank you. There's nothing too hard for you. Work in our behalf and work in us to create this amazing peace, unexplainable peace in the name of Jesus. Would you say amen with me?